The Latin name of this ancient plant and now infamous drug is Cannabis sativa. While this plant has been an integral part of mankind's history for countless years, you will not find it in the history books. It is a plant with two faces. On the one hand, it supplies us with hemp, whose legitimate uses includes closing, canvas, and rope making. And, on the other hand, it is the source of cannabis, the illegal psychotropic drug. This is the story of cannabis sativa, the plant with many, many uses. We are near Le Mans, in west of France. Hemp has been grown here for hundreds of years for both domestic and industrial use. Farmers here still use the traditional method of processing hemp, known as water retting. The stalks of hemp are extremely tough and resistant to rot, which is why it was traditionally used for ropes and canvas. Once harvested, hemp is left to soak in water before it is laid out into the fields to dry, so that the tough fibers may be more easily separated from each other. Even today, hemp fibers are broken down by hand, although an experienced hemp breaker can break from 100 to 200 pounds of hemp a day, this method still adds to the production cost. <laughs> Cannabis sativa is one of the most ancient plants cultivated by mankind Hemp processing was already developed in China 8,000 years before Christ was born. Hemp was first harvested for its seeds, a rich source of amino acids used for food. Then it was discovered that by breaking the stalks, they could use the fibers to make paper, as well as fishing nets and up to 5,000 hemp-related products, including, of course, textiles. The ancient Chinese called the country the land of hemp and mulberry. Mulberry leaves were used to feed silkworms, from which was produced the precious silk that only the rich and powerful could afford. Everyone else wore hemp clothing. Hemp is called ma by the Chinese, literally meaning plant with two forms, male and female. Hemp was also the first crop to be grown for use in war. The Chinese had originally used bamboo to make bowstrings. Then they discovered that the hemp fiber was stronger and lasted longer. Imperial decrees ordered that certain areas of the land would be exclusively used to grow hemp. An ancient legend says that hemp paper was discovered by Siloon, a scribe and unit of the imperial court. To publicize his discovery, Siloon pretended to die. He ordered that hemp paper should be burnt around his coffin then, he arranged his own apparent resurrection and attributed it to the properties of his new invention. Ever since, hemp has been an integral part of the Chinese funeral ceremony known as Wu Fu, or the Five Levels of Mourning. This code lays down, among other things, that the family wear different hemp clothes corresponding to their relation with the deceased. The Chinese jealously kept the secret of paper making for centuries. It wasn't until the 5th century that this knowledge was passed on to other countries, finally appearing in Europe in the 8th century. The word cannabis comes from the Babylonian canna, meaning cane or stalk. Bis meaning twice, with two forms or sexes, cannabis. Interestingly, it has the same meaning in Chinese. The word ma is a word from a completely different culture, yet it means exactly the same. Ma means the plant from which we take the fibers and which has two sexes. For good hemp, you have to look for rich, strong fibers, and these attributes are most marked in the male plant. The female plant, on the other hand, is a plant used in smoking, because all the psychoactive substances concentrate there. It is a plant with two sexes, two attributes. This is something completely fundamental. Cannabis has been used medically since the year 2800 BC, when Emperor Shen Nung founded the science of Chinese medicine. Wounds sustained in battle were bandaged in cannabis leaves. Today, doctors across the whole world are asking for the right to use cannabis as a treatment for pain, especially for cancer and AIDS. 
I'm a cannabis user. I've been using cannabis since I was uh, approximately nine years old. Uh, I've had cancer 10 times. Uh, I first occurred in my spine when I was two years old. I had a spinal fusion, which fused my first five vertebrae together. I went on to have it from two to 10, nine times in eight years. Um, it occurred once again when I was 15. We treated it with radiational therapy. Um, through the years, I've gone through radiational therapy, chemotherapy, and uh, numerous forms of uh, surgery. <laughs> and um, I stumbled upon cannabis once after radiational therapy use. It alleviated my dizziness and nausea, just the secondhand smoke, and it also increased my appetite. And um, right now, I go around the world and I try to teach people about cannabis and its benefits and uh, its usages because I found it so beneficial in my situation. Cannabis was also grown in the foothills of the Indian continent. Today is Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Nepal and Kashmir. Having gathered the hemp harvest, Indian farmers used the water rutting process to break down the fibers, from which they made hemp flour, porridge or even popcorn. The seeds were also used for food and to make unsaturated oil. Cannabis is dedicated to Kali, the Hindu goddess, with two faces, destruction and reincarnation. So cannabis has been completely integrated in religious life on the Indian continent. Cannabis is consumed in a religious way to show devotion to the goddess, as we do ourselves with wine in the Holy Communion of the Catholic Church. Cannabis is also consumed socially. Indeed, you cannot imagine a wedding or a baptism without cannabis on the Indian continent. Hey man, mm. try some of this. It's absolutely dynamite. Oh yeah. The physical effects of marijuana. The first sensations may be felt instantly after having smoked some grass, or an hour after having eaten it. Usually, you creep slowly into a stoned condition, inch by inch, sliding upward, but if you've eaten it, the effects may come upon you suddenly and strike you full force in the mid of a word. In the 3rd century AD, the Roman Emperor Gallion encouraged cannabis use, which he thought would make his people happy. In a declining empire, the Romans turned increasingly to the Oriental gods, Mithras and Zoroaster. Christianity was gaining ground, partly because it incorporated elements of these Oriental religions, but not the use of cannabis. The Roman Empire really went to war on hemp. The Roman Empire provides a very good example of the importance, the strategic importance, one might say, of hemp in any society in history. The Romans had hemp arsenals either side of the Alps. They had one in Ravenna and one in Vienna. And the procurator of hemp was a very important position in the Roman hierarchy. That is not to say that hemp was only used by the Romans to make war with. It had its place in all the aspects of hemp and all the aspects of fibres that you can imagine that it would have, i.e. it figured in clothing, shelter, food, defence, aggression and medicine. Later on, Christians associated cannabis with the devil and its use was supposed to be part of the satanic ritual. By 1484, Pope Innocent VIII declared that smoking cannabis was sacrilegious, and he promoted wine as the only Christian holy sacrament. 
It seems that knowledge of the psychotropic properties of the plant had been lost, at least as far as official science was concerned. It became a hidden secret knowledge. Only people who really had a good knowledge of plants and their healing powers continued to use the plant. And having a good knowledge of plants at that time was not generally a good idea because such people were thought to be witches. They were called witches because they knew about things that ordinary people didn't know about and didn't understand. It was only in the 9th century that hemp cultivation was encouraged again by Charlemagne. In the monasteries, monks wrote their manuscripts on hemp paper by the light of a hemp oil lamp. In 1945, Gutenberg printed the first Bible. It was printed on hemp paper. Here we go. Viva la mota! What does that mean? Long live pot. <laughs> I have a good background and a good education. I have 10 years of college, master's degree in biology, and four years in the School of Public Health at UCLA. So I started putting together uh, a museum. Slowly people started giving me things uh, they thought were hemp. And, uh, I looked around and found things that were historical. Uh, it was a can of hemp seed oil varnish here, and a uh, hemp Bible there that, that I've, I've accumulated, a uh, hundred-year-old flag, uh, and so on. This is an ongoing educational process. I'm learning every day more and more things. People tell me things about hemp uh, while I'm at the museum, so it's very instructive. My mother's a good example. She, when I learned the hemp stuff, I came to her and told her, and she says, no, no, couldn't be, it couldn't be the same plant. I know what hemp is. She's uh, in her 80s now. Uh, you know, I said, sorry. <laughs> and gave her the book, and uh, she's a believer now. In the 16th century in France, François Rabelais, a doctor and writer, wrote surreptitiously about cannabis in his famous book, Gargantua and Pantagruel. He appreciated cannabis so much that he called it Pantagruelion after his hero Pantagruel. Cannabis, for Rabelais, is Pantagruelion. And this plant has such wonderful properties, as he said, that if plants were to choose a king, in his words, a king of the woods, they would have chosen cannabis to be the queen of plants. Rabelais' essay on Pantagruelium, stroke hemp, uh, is corroborated uh, by modern authorities. Uh, in particular, I could cite a noted French historian called, called Pierre Goubert. He was quite convinced that the marked increase in prosperity in the late 16th and 17th century in Western France was due, not exclusively, but primarily to the organization of the hemp and flax industries. Uh, we may remember that at the end of the 15th century, Spain was the mistress of the Indies. And it was, according to Goubert, the organization of the hemp and flax industries and their sale to Spain, their trade with Spain, that led to the rise in births, in marriages, into a general level of both population and prosperity at that time in France. In 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered America and at the same time introduced hemp to the New World. He offered the natives gifts including hemp seeds and cloths. Hemp was used to make sails and rope. Thanks to this crop, France, England, Spain and Portugal could strengthen and increase their maritime power. In 1620, the Mayflower brought the pilgrims to conquer America. 
In the hold, it also brought hemp seeds. A hundred years later, the first drafts of the American Constitution were written on hemp paper. The same paper was used in 1776 for the Declaration of Independence. Cannabis seeds were now also brought into America by the African slaves. The Africans were captured in their own country to be used as slaves in America. They arrived without clothes and were given rough hemp clothes to wear. That was a tradition prison uniform. Western countries rediscovered cannabis, or at least its psychotropic properties, which had been hidden from people for centuries, during the expansion of their empires, which also introduced them to other cultural influences. The English rediscovered cannabis in India, and the French did the same in North Africa. When Bonaparte launched his Egyptian campaign, the soldiers brought back home many souvenirs, including hashish. The modern history of hashish in France goes back to Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. Bonaparte was almost assassinated by an Egyptian who had taken hashish. That's how our relation with cannabis started, because straight away Napoleon banned cannabis in Egypt. For a long time, there has been this theory in France. You can still hear it sometimes said that the word assassin is derived etymologically from the word hashishin. But if you look closely at this theory, this is not a true derivation. Nevertheless, it has been used to discredit cannabis. What is interesting is that you can find the idea again behind the climbing myth. The West has often made such mental contortions in order to prove the real danger of cannabis. England has been using hemp as a strategic material for centuries. At the beginning of the 19th century, ropes and sails for ships were exclusively made from hemp. But 90% of this hemp was imported from Italy and Russia. The United Kingdom was seriously worried about maintaining its hemp supplies during the expansion of the Napoleonic Empire. King George III of England decided to increase the cultivation of hemp and to develop its production in the seaports along the south coast of Britain. Now, Britport is a most remarkable seaport. Uh, it has been making, growing, manufacturing, hemp, flax, sailcloth, ropes, twines, nets, of every conceivable description, since time out of mind. And I use the phrase time out of mind because it was used in the charter by King John of 1213, where he wrote to the Burgesses of Woodport and exhorted them night and day to make cables and ropes of every description. Uh, there were frequent wars with France certainly from early medieval times, until, of course, uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and Bridport took part in that span of history. In 1803, the British Navy organised a blockade against France. Napoleon counteracted by signing an agreement with the Tsar Alexander I. This contract was called the Tilsit Treaty, and it especially forbade any export of hemp to England and America, thereby depriving them both 
of the use of hemp towards their sailcloth, rope, and other hemp product used in the war effort. Despite Napoleon's protests, Alexander I allowed merchants to smuggle hemp to Britain. This is one of the reasons why Napoleon decided to invade Russia. But the severe early winter of 1812 forced him to withdraw his troops and led to the end of his empire. In the early 19th century, in Europe, the mysterious East became the latest rage, as did cannabis smoking. The Oriental wave influenced styles of interior decoration, clothing and travel abroad. To be in fashion, people smoked hashish with a traditional water pipe and discovered its potent effects on lovemaking. In Paris, the famous Hachachin Club was located at Hotel Pimodan. Artists and writers came here to eat Dr. Joseph Moreau de Tours' famous jam, which incorporated hashish. Among them were Théophile Gautier, Eugène Delacroix, Charles Baudelaire, Alexandre Dumas, Gérard de Nerval. Queen Victoria also used hashish. She used tincture of cannabis, a popular method for alleviating period pains. She was also prescribed morphine or laudanum, another popular remedy for many complaints. In Amsterdam, cannabis, which had been imported from the Dutch colonies of South Africa since 1660, was smoked in coffee shops, a tradition that has survived until present day. At the end of the 19th century, Indian migrants brought cannabis into Mexico where it was named marijuana and then became the symbol of Pancho Villa's rebellion with the song La Cucaracha. Mexican farmers on their side copied the Indian water wetting process to prepare the fibers. They made every kind of product, from hats to bags and carpets. Marijuana traveled from Mexico to the southern states of America. Black people working in the cotton plantations smoked it to try and soften their harsh lives, which were aggravated by the economic aftermath of the Civil War. Marijuana fever hit the suburbs of Louisville through Dixieland jazz and swing. Marijuana was known in America as reefer or grass. Within a few years, reefer songs spread widely from the music clubs which had appeared everywhere where the immigrant black community settled. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Along with new developments in the hemp industry and a growing awareness of the dangers of alcohol, marijuana began to be the subject of interest in the corridors of political power. In 1911, uh, New Orleans and then Louisiana and Mississippi and um, a couple of states along the Mississippi River outlawed marijuana. Meanwhile, alcohol was increasingly being seen as a danger to society. American women lobbied for alcohol to be banned. They succeeded with prohibition, which led to illegal speakeasies, the proceeds of which enriched criminals and resulted in violence and gang warfare. Alcohol was legalized again in 1933. And then all of a sudden alcohol is becoming legal again and all these agents didn't have anything to do and Harry Anslinger thought, well, we should have a law against hemp and so did William Randolph Hearst and so did uh, DuPont and the three companies got together and um, other people claimed the cotton industry joined in to outlaw hemp because it was making a huge comeback. And the reason it was making a huge comeback is that it took two to three hundred hours to plant, harvest and break, make ready for fiber acre of hemp. But all of a sudden, in the 30s, in the 1930s, that two or 300 
man hours per acre went down to one man hour per acre. It was a better fiber than any other fiber and, and previous hemp fibers. And that was the beginning of the end of all fibers um, uh, as being the only synthetic nylon, was, which is the new synthetic, would have to make way for the reintroduction of hemp as an inexpensive fiber, as well as the strongest, the best, the longest lasting, and the softest fiber. The government of the United States outlawed a fiber and forced the rest of the world to swallow it. They swallowed the outlawing of the number one fiber on Earth for 10,000 years until the 1930s, and then they outlawed it completely. China, the hemp country, was part of the Japanese plan for military conquest. But in official Tokyo, seat of an empire which for nearly a decade has been governed by its stern and ruthless military caste, there is more activity, more secret comings and goings than in many a year. The little men who command the world's third largest navy see in the South Pacific the richest of all colonial prizes. The Philippines, a group of 7,091 Pacific Islands which, still under the protection of the U.S. flag, constitute the only major hazard to Japanese plans for new conquest in the war year of 1940. Already one important island industry, the growing and processing of Manila hemp, is almost entirely under Japanese control. And within the past few years, by intensive cultivation, Japanese immigrant farmers have increased production of the one cash crop which has long been a virtual Philippine monopoly. The invasion of the two big hemp producing countries, China and Philippines, was the start of hemp rationing. Hitler was also aware of the strategic importance of hemp, which was used in the making of canvas and ropes, both of which were an essential part of his war effort. In 1941, when the German army invaded Russia, it blocked Britain's supply of Russian hemp. Germany managed to develop her own hemp production, but the cultivation of this fiber, which had become so necessary in wartime, was still banned in Great Britain. In 1942, the German troops reached the center of Russia. The land continued to produce hemp, which enabled Hitler to move confidently to the next stage of his plans for the Reich. To safeguard its own supplies of hemp, Great Britain urged India to increase production. Meanwhile, war was spreading to Japan. Within little more than a year, Japan, successfully employing once again the deceit and treachery which had so well served her in the past, had taken the final desperate plunge. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, forcing the United States of America to declare war, Americans realized they were cut off from their hemp supplies. The US Navy was totally dependent upon hemp for rock-resistant ropes for their ships and for many other components. The American government then decided to redevelop their hemp industry. Marijuana was legalized again and farmers received seeds. A propaganda film called Hemp for Victory was then made to encourage this war effort. The Allies' air forces were completely reliant upon hemp. Parachute straps, packs and belts were made out of hemp. No other available fiber was so strong and so reliable under combat conditions. After General MacArthur had forced the Japanese to withdraw from the Philippines, hemp production soon reached pre-war levels again. After the war years, a new world arose from the ashes of the old. India gained independence. Thanks to automation, India doubled its hemp production 
and increased its exports to America and the rest of the world. In peacetime, the United States once again banned the cultivation of hemp and cannabis, but at the same time imported millions of tons of hemp during the post-war economic boom to supply its industries. For this is the Port of New York, a sprawling pattern of activity covering more than 1,500 square miles. Its 650-mile waterfront, an ever-changing mirror reflecting the work of the world and its needs and tastes. Grain from Canada and fish from Portugal and Norway, tires from Akron, and hemp from India. During the post-war years in France, hemp growing and processing went through a revitalized industrial revolution. What is interesting to underline is the fact that in France, hemp culture went on in spite of American prohibition. While prohibiting marijuana in the USA, they prohibited hemp too, and so you couldn't grow it anymore. In France, hemp growing went on. France was a very rural nation at the time, and remained so until the 50s. They continue to cultivate hemp there today. What happened was that synthetic fibers went on to become a huge development. And even in France, in a country where hemp growing was still legal, hemp began to widely decline until the hemp textile industry finally died at the end of the 60s. In the 60s, hippies began a worldwide movement calling for the legalization of cannabis. English and American rock stars encouraged people to smoke it. The Beatles, led by John Lennon, turned England on by singing openly pro-cannabis lyrics. Stone's preference for Moroccan hashish brought them more fans, offering an alternative to the Beatles and to the fashion for things Indian. Hippies then decided to hit the road for Morocco. Do you see the fields over there on the mountain? At this time of year, you can't find any other plant growing there, because this is the only crop that grows here. Can you see how easily it grows? You can find it even in front of the hotel. I think if these people had to choose a symbol, it would definitely be the hashish flower. I think they grow here at least 10 tons of hashish a year, so there must be other people than hippies who buy it. In Jamaica, the Rastafarian religion advocated smoking cannabis. They called it ganja. Herb is the sacrament of the Rastafari church, and basically through studying the Bible, we understand that it's there for the healing of the nation. In other words, it can nourish the mind just as food nourishes the body. Um, it's like a key that can open certain aspects of your mind. And the brain needs feeding just, just as you know, the rest of your body does. But for me personally, it seems to tune you into a certain wavelength that you can't reach without it. Although I do understand that through certain meditations, one can achieve these heights without smoking herb or taking any other drugs. But in, t in the 20th century, I personally don't have the time. So it's like a shortcut to get to this place to help you be creative. And another thing I find really interesting about weed is how through the smoking of it or the trying to, or trying to acquire it, it brings together people of different classes, backgrounds, cultures. And in bringing those people together, there's an exchange of ideas. And through that exchange, other things happen. At the same time, cannabis was legalized in Holland. That's how Ben Dronkers was able to become the first legal producer of marijuana to become a millionaire. Here we find different varieties that me and my colleagues, we test it out by once in a while, looking at the plants 
and try them out. Um, in that sense, it's a wall where people can always look and go back to and say, this variety had a certain smell or, or a certain aroma. Quality is very important and <clears throat> it's the most important factor where we look at. Uh, always people think also about quantities of, of material you can harvest. And of course, it's very difficult to have a balance. Uh, you find plants with very large, big buds, and you find plants with smaller buds. But even the plants like these that have a very small bud is one of our basic plants we, got, we have for the breeding of many of the strong varieties that you can see on this side. It, that means that some of the, the strengths and some of the important potency we always try to bring back in one variety and that is the variety that people buy in the shop and that is the importance of good seed is like any farmer could know that uh, that's the start and then you end up with some good materials. The Sensi Seed Bank grows uh, the best marijuana seeds in the world I think for many years. Uh, also we want to make the best hemp seeds from the world and we're working very hard on that. For that we made a new company that called Hempflex and Hempflex produced in the north of Holland on this moment last year 140 hectares of hemp and coming year we want to go to 1500 hectares. Uh, that is the minimum we want to do and for sure that later on we will have to do more. From that material we have produced last year, we're producing on this moment just the raw fiber and the wood materials, it comes out like that. And from the wood we have the plan to make cat litter and actually the same things like people want to do in England. Uh, it's beautiful wood, you can press from it and also some comp composites like this pressed from fiber and wood. And very interesting what I like one of the things I like myself the most is the isolation material. Uh, it smells good, you can make it fireproof, uh, and it's much better than all the glass fiber that is all in these living rooms out there. So, hemp is the future. Hemp growing depends directly on contracts. We have to sign first a contract with an industrial society through our Hemp Producers Federation. At this point, it becomes possible to grow hemp. A hemp sowing is made each year around May, and you harvest it around the beginning of September. In uh, Le Mans, in France, they produce hemp seeds, which contains a very low toxical agents level. Hemp legalization is very precise and obliges producers to use varieties which have been tested and contain no drug. They must have not only a strong agricultural potential, but a very low THC rate too. A hemp has a great industrial future. According to the tests we have made and the hemp uses we have developed, you can see that hemp adapted well to a lot of industrial uses, well, such as paper, also uh, textile. Hemp textile has been made since the last century, up to the beginning of now the 20th century, and today we start to develop this sector again, and we hope to reach soon a, a top level. As far as other industrial uses are concerned, we have now a lot of French and foreign demands to test this material. Here, for example, amongst others, for hemp industrial use, a German asked us to test and incorporate hemp in the breaking disc manufacturing process because it's very resistant and non-toxic at all, non-toxic for human beings. Hemp renewal has drawn the attention of the American Cannabis Bible and magazine High Times, who sent their intrepid journalist Ed Rothenthal to Europe and Hungary to bring back photographs. 
Ed has issued a book called Hem Today. revolution had grown and by 1992 the British media announced the first legal hemp harvest for 70 years in England. We are often asked whether people can get high from this because obviously people see it as being cannabis, marijuana. We prefer to call it hemp. Um, one of the things we had to convince the Home Office before they issued us the license was that we would be able to comply with current European law which says that you must not grow varieties which have got more than 0.3% THC. Um, which is the cannabinol in, in the plant. And obviously we have been able to convince them with our trials in previous years that the varieties are totally safe. They have checked up on these crops, they've sent inspectors around, samples have been taken to check, and you can get no um, satisfactory effect from smoking any of this crop. Or if you smoke the entire 50 acre field behind me, you would get a very big headache, but uh, would do yourself no good at all. At the first International Ecological Festival in Frankfurt, March 1995, the green activists are successfully promoting hemp culture. The International Hemp Association was formed in 1992. We're based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And this group was formed primarily to facilitate communication between the various groups, sometimes factions within the hemp world. We're a non-political organization. We try to uh, be an impartial liaison between all sorts of factions involved with the cannabis world, whether they be involved with medical use, textile use, oil seed use, any of these various, uh, various uses for hemp. Near the conference, a commercial exhibition shows the possible benefits of hemp and cannabis. Since the legalization of cannabis use in March 1995 in Germany, hemp has become fashionable in the small world of the ecological producers of this country. It's 100% natural cosmetic done um, of the basis of hemp oil. For example, we make this uh, shampoo. It's a um, composition with uh, hemp soap and the hair balm that they use it in combination with the shampoo, the best results gives. We have a perfume since more than one year in the market, a lip balm, care cream, and the soft soap. A real fashion began with the issue of this book on hemp. Hemp has become so popular in Germany that the market today is very good for us. Some of our textiles come from Eastern Europe, from Hungary, Romania, very few from China because we are not yet satisfied with the quality. And we have also our own textiles directly produced here in Germany. I hope it will soon be legal to grow hemp in Germany because a lot of European countries already do it. We still have a very strong bureaucratic system in Germany and for this reason we are not yet allowed to grow hemp. But I think hemp growing will soon be legalized here too. Ecolution uh, attempts to get more hemp grown, produced and sold all around the world. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways. Our, our pride and joy at the project that we take the most satisfaction in is the development of the first hemp jeans, the first 100% hemp blue jeans since Levi Strauss first made them in the 1860s. Hemp seeds and oil are increasingly used in cooking. In Switzerland, a cookery bestseller includes 22 recipes based on hemp. My name is Matthias Brückers. Uh, I'm a uh, journalist and writer, and I edited Jack Herrer's book, The Emperor Worth No Clothes, in Germany. We added a lot of scientific data and stuff uh, on the Ger German and European history of hemp to the American emperor with no clothes. And uh, so the book uh, went a bestseller in Germany immediately. Uh, we started Hanfhaus, a company 
which is developing and selling products from hemp. And um, the most important and most revolutionary product is Sativa, a washing detergent from hemp oil. The main difference is certainly that hemp is an ecological culture. Hemp growing doesn't need any weed kill and no pesticide. This raw material grows naturally and it doesn't need any chemical interventions. This is surely the most important thing. In France, you can even build houses out of boards made of hemp fiber. The producers ensure that they are protected against fire and rot. This material is long-lasting, has good insulating properties and is strong and flexible. Hemp can save the world. Hemp, it can give you food, clothing, shelter, the three basics, then paper, the thing man needs more than anything else in the world. It can give you oils for your brain, for your membranes that you can't get from any other source. It can give you good protein. It can give you all the benefits that the ingenuity of the mind of man can conceive of. It can do that easily because of the enthusiasm that people will have toward a whole new industrial set of tinker toys to balance against the tinker toys of oil. The people who are cutting down the forests, the, the big, big businessmen who want a profit right now, not a profit 20 years from now, uh, pro uh, people who are not trying to think in terms of construction, but they're thinking absolutely in terms of destruction. Now, whoever these people are, they are small men at the center of things. Put hemp into the mix, and maybe they, some of them would get shuffled to the outside, and maybe we'd have a happier life. Anyway, as a science fiction writer, I tell you that hemp is an excitement to me because it's like the miracle ingredient, newly discovered but ancient as time, that can uh, solve all the problems. <laughs>